Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from lunchtimemoviereview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. Welcome back to another episode of Lunchtime Movie Review, the podcast where we look back at some of our childhood favorites and see if they stand the test of time. I am Chris. I am Chad. G'day, I'm Shane. And this time around, we are reviewing a film I think was Disney's uh, most successful film of the 1970s. It is 1975's The Apple Dumpling Gang, starring Bill Bixby, Susan Clark, Tim Conway, Don Knotts, Harry Harry Morgan, and Slim Pickens. So a lot of 80s actors in this one. Uh, But before we begin, a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Donovan's Apple Dumplings. Do you suddenly find yourself needing to feed a gang of small mouse but can only burn salt pork in a saucepan? Then try Donovan's family-sized apple dumplings. Our flaky treats are pre-made and ready to eat in 30 minutes. Simply pop them in an oven and wait for the dough to turn warm and tender. Season with cinnamon and eat all the apple dumplings you want. For breakfast or dessert with ice cream or milk. Are Donovan's Apple Dumplings the best in the West? You bet your ass, Clarice. All right. And as if I haven't been talking enough, I have the summary this time. Russell Donovan is a smooth talking man living in California during the post gold rush era, circa mid 1870s. Is that kind of what we, is that about when you figure? Did you? Yeah, I'd say that. Because the gold rush yeah, was like I, I uh, so. the early 1850s, but they made some later references to like the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll, we'll just say around the 1870s. That'll he, work. He's not a minor, but a pseudo-respectable man that spends his nights gambling and drinking to make a living until he can move to New Orleans to open up his own saloon. First class, too. Red carpets, crystal chandeliers from Europe, two roulette tables, and whores. But this is a Disney film, so they don't mention the whores. Donovan arrives in the boom town of Quake City, California, a town named after the earthquakes that frequent the area and the entire state. He is on an overnight stay on his way to San Francisco. Uh, That night, however, when he's gambling, trouble ensues when Donovan agrees to accept the next morning some valuables for $5. Because John Whittle has to rush out of town immediately for San Francisco on an emergency. Although Wintel duped Donovan once before in Santa Fe, New Mexico, when he sold him the marshal's horse, Donovan agrees to do it anyway because the money will allow him to raise the ante in the current card game he's got going, and accepting some valuables seems simple enough. Right? Well, the next day when Donovan comes, when Donovan goes to get the delivery, he learns that those valuables are the Bradley children, a trio of orphans whose parents died back east and Donovan now has to take care of them. Donovan tries to refuse the delivery, but Homer McCoy, the town's sheriff, barber, justice of the peace, and judge is there, and he witnessed Donovan agree to accept payment for claiming responsibility for Wintel's delivery the night before. McCoy tells Donovan that he's legally obligated to take care of the children until someone agrees to take custody of the kids, but nobody in Quake City really believes that Wintel will ever return. As Donovan stumbles between raising three kids and gambling to make ends meet, he begins shopping the children around to see if anyone will accept responsibility for them. One day, the children find a large gold nugget worth $87,000 in Commodore Mine, a mine that their dad had laid claim to in 1871. Now rich beyond their dreams, everyone in town wants to adopt the little darlings so they can get the gold. Realizing that the kids' best interests are in mind from these adopted suitors, McCoy convinces Donovan to marry Dusty Clydesdale so that Donovan can now keep the kids. Dusty is respectable in town, and she will ensure that the kids will be brought up properly. Dusty reluctantly agrees to the marriage, but right after they get hitched in the barbershop, Wintel returns to town with his attorney to claim the children as his. The kids then convince Amos Tucker and Theodore Ogilvie to steal the gold so Wintel won't want them again and they can go back to Donovan 
But while Amos and Theodore are trying to steal the gold nugget for the second time in the film, their boss, their old boss, Frank Stillwell, shows up with his gang to steal the nugget for themselves. Everyone is discovered in the bank trying to take the nugget, and a gunfight ensues with the townsfolk. Amos and Theodore manage to accidentally blow up the nugget and the entire bank with some old sweaty dynamite. Although the gold is lost, Donovan captures Stillwell and uses the reward money to buy the Benson place. Donovan and Dusty move to the farm with the kids and Dusty's drunk of a father, Colonel T.R. Clydesdale. Amos and Theodore ask for work as farmhands and the group heads out to a very happy Disney ending. And that is the Apple Dumpling Gang. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Until they write again for a crappy sequel a few years later. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is I remember uh, Apple Dumpling Gang rides again a lot better than I did the original. So when I watched the original, I, I kept thinking, oh, I haven't seen this. But I think I've just seen Apple Dumpling Gang rides again a lot more. I think that seems to be the consensus with everybody I've talked to who I've told that we we're going to review this. I don't either. When I was watching this, I'm like, I don't ever remember seeing this movie. So I'd have to watch Rides again to see if that is the one that I actually remember. I know that I saw this one because I remember the bank blowing up and I remember Clarice very well. Um, I remember Bill Bixby. Okay. Um, but that, um, yeah, it's I don't remember it as well. I bet you anything that when I think of it, if I were to see rides again i would remember a lot of that well it was a big hit for disney in 1975 so i mean it's, it's a wonder they took four years to do the sequel in 1979 uh yeah um that reminds me uh chad uh what can you tell us about uh, how well this film did okay guys well the apple dumpling gang was released on july 1 or july 4 1975 depending upon who you ask by the walt disney production company I don't have any statistics on the budget that went into making this film, but its lifetime gross is $36,853,000. It was the eighth highest grossing film of 1975. Um, to give you some perspective, the number one film of 1975, and then I'll give you the rest. Number one was Jaws, followed by the Rocky Horror Picture Show followed by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, then Dog Day Afternoon, Shampoo, The Return of the Pink Panther, Funny Lady, then you would have The Apple Dumpling Gang at number eight, followed by Aloha, Bobby and Rose, which I never heard of that one at all. <laughs> and um, rounding out the top 10 was The Other Side of the Mountain, it was the 106th high, or is the 106th highest grossing G-rated film of all time. Um, let's see, adjusted for inflation, it would be the 62nd highest grossing G-rated film of all time. And let's see, Rotten Tomatoes rankings are kind of telling. The critics have 56% positive and the fans have 60% positive. Um, IMDB has a score of 6.3 out of 10. It did produce, as we mentioned a little bit ago, The Apple Dumpling Gang Rides Again, its only sequel. That was released in June of 1979 and made just almost $21 million. And the stat that I was most curious in it is the 262nd highest grossing Disney film of all time. And that's the stats I have for the Apple Dumpling Gang. I'm very um, interested to think that Rocky Horror Picture Show was the second of 1975, because I thought originally when that was released, it flopped and it didn't make money until afterwards. So, yeah, well, yeah that, I was, that was looking, interesting. Jaws made. $260 million um, domestically, uh, 471 worldwide. Uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show in second was a hundred, just under $140,000, excuse me, $140 million domestically and $175 million worldwide. Okay. Well, on, on this film, you know, um, from what I remember, it's Don Knotts and Tim Conway, but really they aren't in much of the Apple Dumpling Gang. Even though if 
they are pretty much featured on the cover. They're definitely the funniest of the film, but they're pretty, they have pretty small parts uh, considering the overall story. Yeah, that was sort of the point I took out of it. Like I said, once watching it, I didn't really remember ever seeing it. And I was sort of in shock that they weren't, A, the main Apple Dumpling Gang or main members of it. And two, that, like you said, they didn't have a whole lot of screen time in it. But when they were on the screen, they were definitely the highlight of the movie. So I have always enjoyed uh, Don Knotts and, um, yeah, sorry, Tim Conway. Is their work throughout the years, so I was hoping they would be on screen more to do their goofy comedy shticks. Agreed. I wish they were on screen more too, and I think they got some great comic timing when they team up. Uh, just little scenes when they're in front of the saloon and they say, act natural, and then he keeps trying to light his cigarette, and then, you know, obviously sets Don Knotts bottom alight and then lights his cigarette off his burning pants. I think little things like that are just Great. I think it all works. And um, yeah, it's a shame that duo wasn't in it a little longer. But yeah, yeah they were definitely used to sell the movie. Yeah, that was my favorite part of the movie when they were just standing there and Tim Conway kept trying to light a cigarette and Don Motz just kept pushing his <laughs> arm back down and arm back down till he lights his britches on fire. And yeah. Henry Morgan with perfect timing coming in saying your rear end's on fire. <laughs> Yeah, they did yeah, have a lot of good actors in this too. So they did exactly. I oh, I agree. Harry Morgan was uh, just perfect, and I liked how he was. He was the uh, sheriff. He was the barber. He was the justice of the peace. It was good. Yeah, I think one of the the scenes that I did remember a lot was the the Don um, Don Knotts uh, and the rope in the ass and uh, going up the building, and they're like, "How are you yeah. doing that?" That that's another scene that I did remember. Um, I didn't remember the the part where they're both kind of leaning on the the ladder, which was uh, hilarious. You know, on where Bill Bixby's walking, he sees one of them, then he goes to the other side of the building. And there's another one hanging out the same way on a ladder. <laughs> like that was just too great. Yeah, I agree. And th- what was it in, when they were in the firehouse trying to get the ladder out? They basically both walked around the pole and got right back to the, where they began, and they're trying to figure out how they got to where they started from and ended up where they were and it's just great comedy sequences like that that are you have to enjoy and appreciate i I forgot totally that slim pickens was in this until i started watching it i I kept thinking kept thinking blazing saddles i kept thinking dr strange love um yeah again he wasn't in it a lot but i really liked his contribution i really enjoy watching slim pickens in movies he's good So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that in Rides Again, that uh, that Amos and Theodore were the main focus of that movie and not the kids. Yeah, they uh, in the sequel, they um, I guess they go to another town um, after getting tired or looking to, to start a new life at, uh, from the farm. So they go to another town and uh, and kind of get roped into some criminal activity. But the kids aren't in it. I don't think Bill Bixby or um, Susan Clark is in it either. I think they're just referred okay. to in it. Okay. And I think actually that's why it didn't do quite as well because it's – I think if you would have had all of them together, it might have been a little bit better. Yeah. It, Harry Morgan was in it, but he wasn't in it much yeah. from memory. And I think a Disney movie without those central characters of kids – it's not going to work as well, especially in the 1970s. No, I agree. Um, I mean, they're great, but they I don't see their characters as uh, supporting a full film unless you're going to go the Dumb and Dumber sort of way, which I guess they could have, but Dumb and Dumber in the Old West, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of it was kind of like that, their routines. You could say it was very Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, that's what I sort of thought I was getting into when I started watching it was these guys doing the Dumber Dumber routine, but yet uh, took on some kids to help them out. I didn't realize the rest of the story with Bill Bixby's character and Susan Clark's character. And then uh, you definitely had Harry, Mor- Harry, yeah, Harry Morgan's character coming in and the whole um, Slim Pickens' gang coming in later on. It was definitely a big mashup of a bunch of different little 
subplots all jammed into one movie. Yeah. Yeah, I like Bill Bixby too. He he's meant to be this come across this sort of uh brute and chronic gambler and not caring about anything about himself. So when the kids come along, it's great. In typical Disney style, he changes his his uh his way of thinking towards other people and the kids and wants them for himself. And I, I think his moments with uh, Susan Clark are pretty good, especially when he almost asks her for a, a drink. It's a little quaint moment, and then he, he stops asking and walks away. You know where it's going to go. Predictability is fine with stories like this. But, yeah, I think that was done really well. And much like a good episode of Three's Company, the bar fight they had over a misunderstanding about why he's <laughs> buying the bed was just classic. I had more fun watching that bar fight than I did in almost any other part of this movie. Yeah, and the bar fight all began when they ran into the uh, barbershop to get married. And then the guy was, was upset because he only got half a shave. And then, you know, then all of a sudden Bill Bixby didn't have any money, so Susan Clark had to pay for it. And then all of a sudden Bill Bixby went for a drink with Harry Morgan, and that's how they ended up in the bar fight because she got the misunderstanding and followed him, and then it was on. So... That was a one really long choreographed scene that started in the barbershop I thought was fantastic. Probably one of my favorite parts of the film. And it's nice to hear him talk about husbandly duties in a G-rated movie and <laughs> trying to explain that one to the kids. Yeah. Well, I like Bill Bixby in general. When I see him, uh, I still think of him from My Favorite Mar Martian, which I love. Okay. I, I still watch it today. And uh, also during this time, he was... Um, well, this was this was before the Incredible Hulk because I think that was around 1977. But as a kid, I I remember him in the Incredible Hulk series as well. So, um, you know, it, it just he's kind of the uh, Steve Gutenberg of 70s TV, I guess 60s 70s TV. Just your everyman yeah, character. Yeah, I always <laughs> knew him from the Incredible Hulk first, and then um, a little bit of the courtship of Eddie's father. TV show he was in that and then I remember somebody telling me he was in The Magician so I watched a couple episodes of that online one time and I didn't quite get that show but yeah he's always been one of my favorite actors he has that good honest simple face to him and you just he has a presence about him you want to watch yeah totally agree I think Bill Bixby's I'm um, sadly missed because he, he had that kind of human a naturalism about him when he acted and yeah i i didn't watch much of uh the incredible hulk but i do remember reruns of my favorite martian very funny and like you said chris it holds up mm -hmm. yeah him and uh his um chemistry with ray walston was was great i i, I it's just a great uh 60s show so what did you guys think about the rest of the apple dumpling gang the kids um i knew a couple of them once i saw them and it took me a minute to put their faces into place, but Bobby, the oldest one, I remember seeing him in the movie The Cowboys with John Wayne as one of the the cowboys that uh, John Wayne takes on a cattle drive. And then Clovis, the youngest boy, who was one of my favorite characters in this movie, I could not point, picture his face. And I knew I had seen him as an actor in an older, or when he was older, and it finally... IMDB, thank you very much for helping me out. He was Danny in the great 1980s movie uh, Red Dawn. And I was like, thank you for bringing this around to me. But I loved these kids in this movie. I think they all did a great job. Well, the little girl, uh, Celia Bradley, uh, played by Stacey Manning, she's absolutely adorable in this. I mean, it's what you would expect from a, a Disney movie to have a cute little girl. But um, that's not something I would have appreciated as a kid. But uh, as an adult, I thought she was great. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, that's one thing Disney do never get wrong, and that's choose their children for movies just perfectly. And she had her little catchphrase, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go, and that was just hilarious because anyone who's around kids enough, you, that'll happen. They got to go to the bathroom <laughs> all the time. Yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, the 60s and 70s had their – Route 66 and road trips and everything. And I could just see them kind of making fun of uh, the automobile with this uh, this wagon where she, they've got to stop every so often out on the wilderness just so she can go to the bathroom through Indian infested territory and whatever. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was funny. 
It is. It's funny. And the, the kids really did provide some light moments. But again, it seemed so natural. They were, they were great. Yeah, I picked up a new catchphrase I'm going to use from now on. And Clovis don't like to be touched. Um, <laughs> and just kick people. Yeah, just kick people right in the shins and see what happens. And the kid kicked uh, Slim Pickens' character in the leg that, uh, that got shot by <laughs> was uh, shot. Am- Amos. Yeah, and, and you could see the look on Slim Pickens' face. I think as an actor, he loved every minute of it. He was overacting. It was great. <laughs> just just funny scene. No, I think he, he was definitely having a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll agree there. No, he. I mean, he played the villain, but he didn't really seem like a bad guy in this one. So no. <laughs> But, you know, like even in Dr. Strangelove, he, even though he played it straight and didn't realize that it was a comedy, um, you know, yeah. he still looked like he the time of his life screaming on that uh, missile as it was <laughs> starting World War Three. Oh, I know. I got the shock of my life when I saw his name in the credits and I was really happy he appeared in it. Um, yeah, that uh, Dr. Strangelove and Blazing Saddles is my two go-to Slim Pickens movies. Oh, and speaking of uh, Blazing Saddles, it makes me think of Alex Karras and um, his wife, oh, uh, Susan Oh, I know Clark. exactly where you're going. <laughs> yeah, it's like... That was his wife? I ne- yeah, Susan Clark is uh, Alex Karras' wife, mm. or, and um, they, I never knew them in anything where they weren't together, because as a kid, they were, they were the parents in the TV show Webster with Emmanuel Lewis. But um, I'm going to see if I'm Shane and I are on the same wavelength here. They were in the movie Porky's together, where Alex Karras played Porky's brother, who was the sheriff, and Susan Clark, who played Magnolia or Dusty in um, the Apple Dumpling Gang, played the prostitute Miss Cherry Forever in the movie Porky's. So they once again worked together in the same film. I was shocked that Alex Karras didn't pop up in this film. Yeah, maybe they were not married yet or hadn't met yet because uh, Susan Clark was a little younger than she was in uh, Porky's, but I can't believe in the Apple Dumpling Gang we managed to bring up Porky's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they did a TV movie about 1975, 1976, and I think right. they met and. uh they got married that, in 1980. 1980. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, I just uh, I just googled it while you were talking. Yeah, I think they met on a TV movie and then they started they working together, got married, and and think until he passed away, they were still doing everything together that they could. Yeah, well, Porky's is a whole another podcast, but when she came on screen in that hat and she <laughs> she was playing like she was a bit of a cross between. Matty Ross from True Grid and Calamity Jane, and I couldn't pinpoint who I, you know, she was, who, where I knew her from, and then it hit me, <laughs> Cherry, Cherry Forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, man. I will never see her without thinking of that movie. Yep. Now, I don't know what you two are talking about. I've never seen that film. <laughs> <laughs> I only watch Disney films. Apple Dumpling Gang, Herbie Goes. Goes to Portugal or something like yeah. that. Herbie was meant to come down under once, but the film got canned. Oh, well. Now, I've never had an actual apple dumpling, but watching this movie and the kids tuck into some, they looked all right. They are very good. My, it's something my grandmother used to make uh, from scratch all the time, and we loved it, uh, holidays because she'd make them for dessert. And I'm a big fan of the apple dumplings. Yeah, I've never had them, but, um, I mean, how can you go wrong with apple, cinnamon, and dough? I mean, really. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Throw some vanilla ice cream right on top. It's a perfect dessert. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the special effects when the kids were in the tunnel uh, with that earthquake? They were, they were done quite well. And it was only a year earlier the movie Earthquake uh, was released. So maybe Disney borrowed the idea or the techniques because it looked kind of similar. Yeah, that was a very realistic scene. I'll give you that one because I was like, uh, man, they – shook that yeah. thing just right they had the bat going through there they had uh, everything falling just right i was pretty impressed by that and it wasn't quick they kept doing it. it it wasn't like it was just a quick scene the effects lasted and it were impressive yeah as long as they weren't in front of some sort of blue screen or green screen where uh you could definitely tell that uh 
they uh, didn't match or they were uh, being uh, uh, in front of a filmed screen. I think that was looking a little dated, but the the earthquake scene definitely looked great. And um, they did a good, uh, even the explosion at the end, you know, uh, mm-hmm. that was almost Wile E. Coyote in a way where it's just an explosion far off. But that's still, <laughs> it didn't look too out of place in it. So, Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. That was... Good explosion, and I agree. Other than the horseback riding scenes, like you said, you can tell they're in in front of a blue screen. This was very authentic looking. They did a good job of filming this on a set that was authentic as could be. I agree with you with that fight scene on the horseback finale, and it was no stretch in special effects, but it kind of fit, still fit the movie. And yep. they were fight, fighting on the raft, and the water was getting sprayed on them, but it still all worked. You know, I, I think it was fitting for its time and yeah it's 70s yeah, disney I, so it's it's good. yeah that's right but the earthquake scene uh came out of nowhere in a way and it impressed me i thought they put a bit of money into this well i had one question about the i guess the story that i get maybe i missed it and you guys can help me out what uh tie did john wintle actually have to these three kids where he could actually claim them um was he a second cousin Say, because I never did quite catch that. No, neither did I. I did. I do think the word distant relation was used in that sentence, but when he first walked in, but I, I don't know. I, I might have missed it as well. Okay. Well, that, that scene where they had the hearing for the possession of the children, that, that was a little bit out of character for <laughs> Disney too, in a way. Yeah, that was a little far-fetched and. I didn't quite get all of it, but I mean, they just did what they could, I guess, to sort of yeah. have to try to get the kids out of uh, Donovan's hands and out of Dusty's hands and try to make it seem like it was legal for them to be taken away. But yeah, it was a little bit odd. And we all know that was never going to happen. It was all, all live happily every, ever after. <laughs> oh, yeah. And how how many movies did Don Knotts and Tim Conway team up for? Uh, was it only these two? No, I thought they did quite a few, and I thought there there's one that I can't remember what it was that they were more famous for, and it's uh, it's escaping me now. I'm gonna look it up on IMDb. Yeah, but no, I think they did some up in through the early '80s, actually. Okay, I I have a feeling that uh, Don Knotts was in Cannibal Run too. I'm not sure if Tim Conway was. I think they both were. Okay. Are you thinking of Private Eyes? Yes, that's one I was thinking of. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I don't think I've seen it, but I remember the cover on VHS. Yeah, where they're kind of like a um, Sherlock Holmes type thing. Second rate Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Prize Fighter. I didn't see that one. I've seen Private Eyes, but that one's been a long time ago. I can't play some in Cannibal Run 2, though. Don Knotts was a police officer. At, there was two of them on the highway, so maybe it was Tim Conway. I mean, it's uh, been years. It is both. It. It's both of them. It does say here in Cannonball Run 2, um, I know Tim Conway is the CHP officer number one. I think Don Knotts is his partner in it. There you go. That's so long ago. I, I really just remember the first Cannonball Run. Uh, if they remade the Apple Dumpling Gang, I don't think that'll happen because Eight Million Ways to Die in the West uh, ruined any comedy westerns for the next few years. But if they were to remake the Apple Dumpling Gang, uh, who would play the Don Knotts and Tim Conway characters? You'd think maybe Jim Carrey could have been, could be one, or is that too much like Dumb and Dumber as we mentioned earlier? I could see Will Ferrell or um, right. Uh, who else could? Could do it. They probably they probably hit me right in the nads and put Ben Stiller and Luke or Owen Wilson in it, and I just couldn't handle that, so I'd have to boycott. But, <laughs> no. Yeah, well, maybe not Owen Wilson. They did uh, those Shanghai Noon movies with Jackie Chan and him. So I, I do think that sick. there are comedians that could could do it. They're not going to be uh, as talented. I I think Tim Conway and uh, Don Knotts are just besides just funny people, they're also masters of nonverbal comedy, which yeah. I don't think is easily replicated in a film. Cause if you look at a still of Tim Conway in this movie, he looks like a dirty evil 
scoundrel, but you <laughs> know who Tim Conway is and how he does things uh, from a comedic point of view. You can tell that he's actually just a buffoon who's having fun and he acts like a buffoon. And yes, he looks one way, but you know, that's not his personality. So um, like you said, he is a master of uh, nonverbal comedy and it shows all the time. I mean, if you just, if you ever see him doing the dentist sketch with, um, with Harvey Corman, where he uh, numbs his leg you know, by uh, sticking the needle in his leg. I mean, th that scene just exemplifies yes. just how good he is at nonverbal comedy, uh, just over and above the apple dumpling gang. So I think he would be a tough one to uh, yeah. to replace. Yeah, because he and Harvey Corman, and when I would go back and watch old episodes of the Carol Burnett show, I would literally uh, just laugh and cry until my side hurt watching those guys because they were geniuses and they were great comedic actors and they didn't have to try. They just were great comedians and they studied their own craft and knew how to make each other laugh. And that's all they wanted to do was just have fun and make each other laugh. And it showed. Uh, I think it was one of the first Disney movies to be released on VHS when I was having a look back at some of the uh, facts about the movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting because being made in 75, the VHS sort of boom was early 80s. That's good that they, did, they just didn't uh, put on VHS their current hits. So, uh, yeah, that was an interesting little fact. And well, I, I still notice... think that I read somewhere that this film was Disney's biggest. Um, I don't know if it was biggest out of all their films of the 70s or their biggest live action film of the 70s. So maybe that's why they went with it first on VHS. That, that would probably it just to milk more money out of it and mm -hmm. yeah. for it to be a big hit. And, and, and in those days, like the movies would have been running in cinemas for, you know, a good year. If they were popular, they'd just keep on going and going. So. Um, you're right, Chris. I think that the, that's the fact that it must have been released on VHS first because of that being so well, I popular. Get, I guess I, one uh, point that I guess I wanted to make, and I forgot to bring it up. Um, just stop and think that Jaws was released just uh, under a month before this movie, and it went on to make all the money it made. And this movie still made a $37 million. I mean... That year ran into a juggernaut and still made a good amount of money and is one of the highest grossing Disney movies ever. So I I give props to the popularity of this movie based on that statistic alone. Uh, exactly. And I think Jaws changed, as they I've read and seen in documentaries, Jaws has changed the way movies were released. The summer blockbuster was born. So, yeah, I think the Apple Dunk Dumpling Gang to ride – such success afterwards, it's really good for Disney. And the director, Norman Toker, I did notice uh, he directed one of my other favorite 70s Disney movies, The Cat from Outer Space. Obviously not as funny as the Apple Dumpling Gang, but in its own way, it's a bit of a classic. Well, let's go around uh, the table. Uh, Chad, uh, what do you think of this film and does it stand the test of time? Well, like I said earlier, I don't really remember watching it as a kid, so it's one of those things I'm now watching it probably for the first time as a 40-year-old man. So I will say it stands the test of time because I did enjoy it. Um, got a lot of laughs out of it, especially the Don Knotts and um, Tim Conway characters, Amos and Theodore. So I would recommend it to anybody to watch it. It's a funny little movie. It's a cute movie, and definitely family friendly and has a good uh, moral story to it. So I will say it stands the test of time. Yeah, totally agree with Chad. Uh, I'll just add that Disney, uh, their formula always seems to work for me. Really enjoyed it. I don't remember it uh, as we mentioned either, but I thought I remembered uh, Apple Dumpling Gang rides again. And uh, this was good to watch again. And, and these actors, are they're so well, the timing is so well done and the, the little nonces in their characters, all fantastic. And I can't believe we got to mention Porky's in this same 
uh, podcast. So there you go. That's something I didn't expect. Uh, but as far as the Apple Dumpling Gang uh, is concerned, yeah, it definitely stands the test of time. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's one I'd recommend to if I was looking after some kids or some parents. You know, it's something you can put on and the kids would get a, uh, this mo- even this modern era, era, I think, would get a great kick out of it. It's lots of fun. Good film. Yeah, I'll agree. I mean, Tim Conway and Don Knotts are, are just the, the masters of comedy, so you can't go wrong with them. Bill Bixby's another person that I uh, that I have fond memories of as a kid, as an actor for some of my favorite shows. And Henry Morgan, I, he was pretty big in MASH during this time, I believe. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, these were they got very well-known actors. They, they weren't big-time movie stars, but they were, uh, they were definitely family-friendly and people... Uh, would turn out to see them. So, you know, other than a few uh, hokey sc- scenes with the the screens that you could tell are dated, everything else holds up very well in this film. And, you know, it's just a nice little film for the whole family to watch for sure. That does it for this week's review of the Apple Dumpling Gang. Thanks once again for listening to our little podcast. If you had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, information on upcoming podcasts on the MHM Podcast Network, including this one as well as the number two review, Movie House Memories, Mail Bonding, Sunday Seconds with the Duke, and Film House Hustlers. Additionally, Shane A. writes regularly for SydneyUnleashed.com, You can follow him on Twitter at movie underscore analyst, where you can keep up on his film reviews and celebrity interviews. You can also follow Chad at this underscore is underscore CMM as always not to be confused with a certain (laughs) news network. (laughs) Well, that does it for this episode of lunchtime movie review until next time. I am Chris. I am Chad. I am Shane. We have to get out of here, and you guys are invited. But not the girls. Ooh, they're icky. Uh, This podcast is not endorsed by Walt Disney Home Video and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The Apple Dumpling Gang, all names and sounds of the Apple Dumpling Gang, characters and any other the Apple Dumpling Gang related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Walt Disney Home Video or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC, unless otherwise noted.